with all the controversy around Canadian LNG and the whether the question of whether or not we should build more plants on the West Coast, never mind the East Coast, one of the questions that doesn't get asked, never mind answered, is what does it cost to produce LNG in Canada versus other jurisdictions, competing jurisdictions? So I'm going to talk to uh, Clark Williams Derry, who is with the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. They've just released a report on this topic. So welcome to the interview, Clark. Thanks so much for having me. Well, this is a question that I have been trying to get answered for a while. And I want to start with a chart that you have got in your report that compares the cost for LNG Canada, which is the big $40 billion project in Kitimat, versus the U.S. Gulf Coast. The cost comparison is in Canadian dollars for a million BTUs. And the LNG Canada comes in, it looks to me like a smidge over $8. And the U.S. Gulf Coast is over just over $4, roughly half the cost. And it, right. is, have right. I got that right? Yeah, this is a, a, a comparison of some of the costs of running an LNG facility. It doesn't include necessarily the cost of gas, but it does include some of the hard costs for capital, for pipeline transportation, uh, and for operation. If it doesn't include gas, uh, gas in Canada is generally competitive with gas produced down in, in the U.S. as a rule, correct? As a rule, that's correct. So, you know, right now we're seeing in the U.S. prices in U.S. dollars of about uh, 260, 270 per mm BTU for gas. It was as high as nine dollars last year during the sort of the, the global gas crisis when uh, a lot of U.S. LNG was being shipped out. It was raising U.S. gas prices. But overall, gas in, in the U.S. tends to be a little more expensive than we'll, you'll see in the Montney Basin. But in contrast, the cost of infrastructure, the cost of pipelines, the cost of LNG, capital expenditures for for the plants, it's much higher in Canada than it is in the U.S. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Some of them I actually are due to factors that I really can't explain. But it's just a sort of a fact that infrastructure is more expensive. But you look at the Gulf Coast, a lot of these projects are on you know, previously industrialized sites. They are, in, in some cases, a lot of the U.S. LNG plants were actually on the sites of old LNG import terminals that are just been basically been turned around. So a lot of the infrastructure already existed. In contrast to a place like Kitimat, it was very remote, uh, and you're basically building a greenfield project in a place where there's really not a lot of infrastructure to start with. And the costs, the resulting costs in Canada are much higher. And that's true whether you're looking at the pipeline costs, whether you're looking at the infrastructure costs. And that's that those hard costs, the, the, the hard costs of building the infrastructure in Canada often put Canadian LNG projects at a disadvantage to other projects around the globe. Uh, that includes in the U.S. Now, I, that makes perfect sense to me in a way, because we know that uh, clustering of industrial operations brings down unit costs because you have supply chains near at hand that can scale up. You have access to uh, to workers, you know, skilled workers, those those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Those bring costs down. They bring efficiencies and productivity up. And it makes sense that in Texas and Louisiana, in that Gulf Coast area, you would have a lot of that, whereas you just wouldn't have it on on the uh, on the West Coast. Now, how does uh, uh, LNG Canada's costs compare to other competitors, say Australia or the Middle East? Uh, well, LNG Canada is actually one of the more expensive projects globally, um, and that was, I mean, they've they've kind of lucked out in a way. Uh, we've seen a pretty r rapid increase in infrastructure costs all across the board, but LNG Canada was was uh, benefits from a fixed price engineering contract, so that you know it's not seeing the same kind of cost escalation for the infrastructure at Kitimat that they are in other parts of the world. But you know, in general, LNG Canada is sort of on the high end of of sort of global LNG projects. The be what it benefits from is a relatively short trip from to from Canada to China to to uh, Asian markets that some other places don't have, but the infrastructure costs are high. Okay, so uh, I think this is really important because there's a, a lot of calls to increase LNG. So uh, I just did an interview with uh, Dr. Chris Bataille, a, a 
viewers can see it on the Energy Talks podcast. Uh, it'll be in its Google or any of the popular platforms. And one of the questions that we asked over and over was, is there a business case? And I was of the opinion there isn't a business case. Chris was less certain. He said it's a risky business case, but maybe there's one there. And the argument is that Yes, Canada has competitive advantages. The West Coast does. You mentioned transportation cost to market. Mm -hmm. That would be better. Uh, you know, being no further north is, is, is colder. So liqu liquefaction costs can, can be lower. But when you take all of the costs together, what you're saying is that Canada is not one of the competitors. Sounds like more like a marginal producer as it's, opposed it's to a competitive of, producer. I think it's a good way of putting it. I mean, it's so... It, in my view, one of the main reasons that LNG Canada moved forward in the first place was that the equity owners of LNG Canada, companies like Shell and Petronas, they owned the upstream production as well. And so they had sort of an integrated position. That means that they were the ones who were producing the gas or potentially producing the gas in the Montney Basin and also liquefying it and sending it overseas. Now, that gives them, in some ways, some ability to control their cost, the cost of gas. They don't have to go to the market. They can produce it themselves. But the, the key reason that LNG Canada moved forward even though it was a relatively high cost project, project was that companies like Shell had a big reserve position. They had on their books the Montney Basin gas as proved reserves. But if there's no market for it, they have to write off those reserves. So it, this was as much a reserves management exercise as a competitive LNG production exercise. It was a way for Shell to avoid writing off abundant gas reserves that, that are far from, from most markets. You know, they, they get it to market, they're able to keep it on their books as reserves. And that made up for, in some ways, the, the sort of the, the challenged economics of the project that have just gotten harder as the, the coastal gas link uh, costs have, have risen. Well, let's talk about that because um, you've released uh, an update on that. Uh, I think it was just today or yesterday. Uh, Coastal Gas Link uh, issued a press release about its rising costs. What can you tell us about it? Well, yeah. So I uh, last year, Coastal Gas Link, the TC Energy, the company that, that's that's uh, behind Coastal Gas Link, uh, they uh, said that costs had escalated. The original estimate was around, I think it was was six billion dollars, six point six billion dollars. Uh, to build the, the the pipeline from the Montney Basin to Kitimat. Uh, but then that ex escalated to $11.2 billion, which was, you know, what the, the numbers that we used in our report to estimate the actual cost of getting gas are based on that $11.2 billion estimate. But what they said now is the costs have risen even further. They've reached $14.5 billion. Uh, and you know, that's if they are able to complete construction this year. And it goes up to, you know, somewhere in the $15 billion range next year uh, if they have to continue into 2024. So, uh, you know, what we're seeing is this tremendous increase in the cost of the coastal gas link pipeline far beyond the initial estimates. You know, what you've basically seen, you know, you know cost increases that dwarf what you've seen. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's, infrastructure is getting more expensive in the Gulf Coast, but not this way, right? And so probably at this point, if if the the backers of LNG Canada were looking at the economics now that they know about you know, the, the 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 pipeline costs that are not six billion, not seven billion, they're 15 billion. It's not clear that this project would have be authorized under today's economic conditions. And it sounds like those economic conditions are going to be worse because there's a new is there a new BC royalty regime being considered? Or has it been introduced already? It's been it's been introduced, and it is it is in the process of getting phased in over time, and so that's going to raise upstream gas costs a little bit. And of course, you may be familiar with the controversy about the Blueberry Blueberry River First Nations um, lawsuit, the successful lawsuit that was decided in, in favor of the Blueberry River First Nations by the BC Supreme Court, that basically put some new limits on development of oil and gas in the Montney Basin on the traditional territories of the Blue Bear River First Nations. And, you know, we're not sure what the results are going to be. There's a recent announcement, announcement just a few weeks ago, that they'd sort of broken the log jam, they've come to an agreement, and some new uh, drilling permits are going to be allowed to be issued. It was seen as sort of, you know, kind of a like a uh, you know, an increase in regulatory certainty. 
which is, you know, maybe that's a good thing for, for the BC gas industry. But on the same, at the same time, what we're seeing is that there's still a lot of uncertainty about how this decision and how the new deal, the new agreement between the BC government and the Blue Bear River First Nations, how they're going to, you know, actually implement this new uh, regulatory regime. One of the requirements is, is that they have to cut the development of land, the new disturbance of land in half compared to uh, the, the how things were before the decision. So you're going to have to have a growth in production while having the disturbance of land. That's creating new uncertainties for the gas industry on the upstream side. What about now? There's another project that's proposed, which is the wood fiber LNG uh, at uh, Squamish, BC, mm -hmm. uh, which is north of Vancouver. Uh, where do we have an idea about what wood fibers costs are? Yeah, so they came out with uh, with new cost estimates as well, and and you know this is when Enbridge Enbridge is a pipeline company that has agreed to take an equity stake in the in the in the wood fiber LNG project. Uh, they were putting the cost of the project along with the pipeline at five point one billion dollars U.S., which is what you know works to uh, out to about um, six point six billion dollars Canadian, give or take. So this winds up being a fairly expensive project when you compare wood fiber versus, say, a comparable project in the Gulf of uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, wood fiber, it's a pretty small project and they've got a lot of the, the capacity already contracted. But the actual cost of building the pipeline and building the pipeline access and, and, the, and the facility itself winds up being more than $2,000, maybe about $2,400 per ton of capacity. And that compares with on the U.S. Gulf Coast, maybe $800, $900 for the capacity. Um, and so it's, you know, it's possible that this project moves forward. Again, like anything's possible. Markets are funny. People make decisions for all sorts of reasons. But what we're seeing with the numbers right now is that wood fiber has a clear, clear cost problem. It is expensive to build wood fiber uh, and more expensive than many of the competing projects that might be that, you know, investors might put in money into elsewhere in the world. Now, I want to draw the analogy to marginal costs in or marginal production in uh, in oil, because in Alberta in particular, for you know many um, most of the history of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, uh, oil production has been it's been a marginal barrel. So that means that when prices are higher, then you can make money, and and so in conventional production you would drill when it's when it's uh, high prices are high and stop drilling when prices are are low and for a long time uh the oil sands were a marginal barrel as well they were a high cost high cost barrel right. now the oil sands have driven their cost down so low now uh in the 30 to 40 dollar a barrel uh, break even that right. they are now a competitive barrel Mm -hmm. And so even when prices drop, they can still make money. They're still, mm -hmm. uh, they're still viable. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that for Canadian LNG will be able to do what the oil sands did and make themselves go from a marginal producer to a competitive producer? No, that's hard. That's an interesting question. I mean, the problem is that, you know, like, I, I guess like with the oil sands, you know, the the real cost, the biggest cost of a lot of these projects is the infrastructure itself. And that gets spent up front. So it's not like, you know, if you if you spent $40 billion or $20 billion on your project, is no way to bring down those costs because those costs are already spent, right? So what you, you know, moving forward, what you may find is that these projects may get used even if you know the you know the prices are not all that great but they may get used because the, the capital's already been sunk i mean the sunk cost of building a, a, an lng infrastructure you know building your pipeline it's you know once it's built it's already in the ground then you moving forward you sell things on a cash basis and you just hope cross your fingers that that cash basis the cash you're making from your sales you know the the, the gap between what you're buying your gas for and what you're selling the, the lng for that's going to like actually produce the profits that are going to you know help you recoup the initial construction costs but there's no way of sort of squeezing construction costs after they've already been spent right uh so if i'm looking at your chart correctly the one we referenced uh, earlier yeah, sure. uh 
liquefaction operation uh, in LNG Canada is actually a little less than the U.S. Gulf Coast. Absolutely. So you're, it's it's you're colder, op- right? Right. So your OPEX is in on the West Coast is lower than your OPEX in the Gulf Coast. So if you went on cash costs only uh, and you didn't have to for, you know, when prices are low, you didn't calculate the, the cost of your capital, uh, then, in fact, it would be at least sustainable. You could. Right. You, you're not, right. If, if you're you not got to be profitable, you, but yeah. You know, like going forward, you may be producing cash, but also producing losses at the same time because you're not recouping the costs that you are. You know, you're really counting on those those margins you get from buying cheap gas in in the Montney Basin or producing cheap gas in the Montney Basin and selling it at a huge markup in Asia. And you know, there's there's a you know there's usually a big arbitrage opportunity there. Don't know that that arbitrage opportunity is going to persist, but you can, you know, you buy buy cheap and then you sell high. But the problem is that if your liquefaction costs, the capital costs, if were high to begin with, then you may not actually be able to, you know, produce profits, even if you are still producing a free cash flow on every unit of gas you're selling. It's just not enough to to, to capture what you needed to justify spending all that capital up front. And that's no. one of the reasons I think. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to to wrap up our conversation by sure. putting the bigger context in place for this because I've been through the uh, BP Energy's uh, recent uh, energy outlook, uh, been through the International Energy Agency's World Energy uh, Report, and for LNG there are always three scenarios, and there's there is one scenario the the sort of you know the most conservative scenario where demand for LNG rises slightly between now and 2050. Mm -hmm. But the other two scenarios show a a sharp drop off. Mm -hmm. And the the middle scenario, which is not the net zero, is probably the most likely. And it would show uh, demand peaking uh, in 2030, early 2030s, and then declining out to 2050. Mm -hmm. So if you're a marginal producer, that's not good news for you. It's not. I mean, so one of the things that the LNG industry has been counting on is robust demand growth, particularly in Asia, right? I mean, Asia has been the place, China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or uh, India. That was where the growth was going to happen, that sort of quadrant of the world. But what we've seen over the past couple of years, uh, you know, since the end of 2021, really, uh, is that there hasn't been a lot of demand growth in Asia, and that's because prices have been so high. And prices have been so high because of the Russian crisis. You know, Russia has upended global LNG markets by, you know, shipping less gas by pipelines to Europe, and Europe is now buying up all the LNG cargoes it can. So we're not seeing the demand growth that, we're, that we expected to see in Asia, because they just can't afford, you know, Bangladesh can't afford to compete with Germany for, for a, a, a tanker full of, of LNG. It's just, you know, there's, they're just too poor. And so really, the demand growth scenario that everybody was envisioning has not materialized. And we think that that's going to continue happening for the next several years because Europe is going to be snapping up all the available cargoes it can to backfill from shortfalls from Russia. And that means that the this sort of like, you know, the bonanza of Asian LNG demand growth may not materialize. And that's without even considering the climate considerations. I mean, if you're, we're actually are going to keep to a net zero target you know, there's, it's going to be very hard to do that while building a massive LNG uh, demand elsewhere, all, th- all throughout the world. So, you know, like, I think that there are some real questions about the long-term demand for the industry. Yeah. And I, and I think the point here uh, that we need to make is that the Russian invasion of, U- uh, of Ukraine has heightened concerns about energy security. And the response from, you know, from Europe, for sure, with the repower EU plan is to say, OK, we're worried that we are uh, requirement to import uh, oil and natural gas makes us our us and our economy really vulnerable to to China, to 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 Russia, to maybe other bad actors who might hold them hostage. And the way to get around that is to build out electricity generation, whether it's nuclear plants, whether it's wind, mm-hmm. whether it's solar. But the that that our our repower EU plan is all about electrifying the uh, EU economies as fast as they possibly can. Now they can't do it in the short term, and as you say, they're going to have to suck LNG out of the the Asia market 
to, but eventually, you know, maybe 2027, 2028, that the experts think that's going to turn around. Yeah. And, it, but, and I, yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and the point is, but Asia is also doing, you know, the Asian countries have looked at that and went, uh, okay, now we're a little worried about being held hostage and energy security is now, you That's know, if you're right. China or Vietnam or Thailand, or now you're having the same uh, concerns that Europe has. So my guess here, and this is, you know, things are very fluid and uncertain at the moment, but there's a real danger that we get to the, the late 2020s and everybody of the, 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 Developing countries and the developed countries are all busy electrifying and building out electrical generation capacity, and the LNG uh, market is in big trouble. That's right. And the, one of the ir ironies here is that it's really 26 and 27 when the big wave of new liquefaction plants is coming online. In the US, in Qatar and elsewhere, there's going to be a like a basically a tidal wave of new supply coming. And it's gonna that's gonna crash into essentially four years of low or stagnant demand growth, uh, along with European demand is falling because of what you say, our repower EU, where you know it's really the economic security, the the like the the physical security, the you know, in, in geopolitical security and the climate concerns are all pointing in the same direction you know reduce your gas consumption so yeah i think that's going to be a very interesting ride to see over the next few years how the lng industry develops but you know in this context of potentially a global demand uh you know shortfall or a supply glut if you will uh in 26 27 that makes new projects that much harder to justify Especially, I think that's especially the ones that are high cost. Right. That's the key is we could be wrong. Like we've, Absolutely. we've kind of paint, we've painted the worst case scenario here and we could that's be wrong right. and it could be a better uh, scenario come 25, uh, you know, 20, 26, 28 uh, and so on. It's the uncertainty though, that is likely to, to uh, hamstring uh, Canadian LNG production because it's it if it is the marginal production as we've argued here, then it's the marginal production that will not get the final investment decision That's right. before any others. That's right. You know, if if you're the the highest cost on the stack, maybe you get overlooked. I mean, maybe you look. You know, if the somebody wants to take a gamble on LNG, one of the things they're gambling on is low cost. So. Well, Clark, uh, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating conversation, and happy uh, to help. We'll, We'll, we'll have you back in the future to discuss LNG because it is not going away in Canada. It is not. I'd love to chat. Thank you so much for having me.